And uh, I want to thank you all for welcoming here, me here to my first visit to Iowa. So this is very exciting. <laughs> and I really loved, I thought I'd start for a second just uh, talking about what I find to be really awesome about HCI, <laughs> just like the rest of your faculty did. Um, I too love the interdisciplinary nature of HCI, but one thing I hear, heard that's really exciting here is the real breadth of faculty and students that you have involved. And it's a dream to have you know, geologists and biologists and political scientists and folks really from all over campus engaged in HCI. And so that's why I'm so excited to be here and talking to you guys. Uh, so I'm Amy Ogan and I'm uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm in our Human Computer Interaction Institute, which is, so we have a very different structure. We have a whole department of HCI and the department is within the School of Computer Science. So uh, we are situated within computer science and yet bringing in this interdisciplinary um, community from all over campus by having additional um, majors and, um, and uh, collaborators from all over campus. So one of the things that I really love about that is the way it expands all of our mindsets and our ways of thinking about research problems. So if I did not have uh, designers and uh, machine learning experts and psychologists and uh, artists in my uh, faculty with me, I'd be thinking about problems from a very limited perspective. So what I'm hoping you'll see today in my talk is a wide variety of perspectives represented and hopefully a broader sense of, you know, thinking about humans and technology. And so all of my work is in educational technology in the learning sciences, um, which is a strong part of our particular department in HCI. And so some of the things that I think about are how do we push the boundaries of what we can do with learning technologies? So, you know, a great thing for my field is that we're really in the midst of an education breakthrough around the world. And you can see a little bit in this chart uh, the number of children who are now able to access schooling, which has significantly increased in all regions of the world. Um, this shows, it's a little bit old, the UNESCO only puts these out up every couple of years, but we got between 2000 and 2013. So you can even imagine where it's gone since 2013. Huge numbers of children who are actually able to be in a schooling environment now. But as you know, we also have not solved the problems of education. And in fact, uh, COVID has been a significant contributor to major challenges in education, which I think we've all felt. Uh, so billions of students now remaining at home and uh, having challenges even getting into school. But it was true even before then that uh, while still children may be in schools, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting all of the opportunities that they could have out of there. And so what we see here is um, some statistics about uh, low-income countries, and uh, this is out of the children who are actually able to go to school, how many are leaving school uh, with the basic skills that they need to get a job, to uh, have their potential realized in the world. And while you know, I'm concerned about low-income countries, we also have challenges in middle-income countries, and as you all well know, we have plenty of problems here in the United States as well in making sure that children are able to achieve their potential. Um, so, you know, 30% of students in the U.S. and other high-income countries will only learn basic primary level skills. So, Enter technology. <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, technology is a great place to start as a potential solution uh, for challenges in education. Um, but what we find is that really, you know, this is the one laptop per child. So 15 years later, billions of dollars later, uh, we cannot just fix problems of education with technological determinism. That is you know, 
if they have computers, that fixes everything. So we know this is not a success. Um, and yet, we know also that educational technology can actually be really effective. So here are just you know, one set of results uh, that I've been associated with. Uh, two to four times gain of uh, reading fluency with a, pro a project called um, Project Listen. 30% uh, more math learning for middle school students when you give them these robots. Um, peer tutors that can give significantly better support to fellow students in their class when they've got an AI along with them, and so on and so forth. And we also know that this is true even in low and middle income country contexts. So that's really exciting for me to think that um, it's not that technology is just a, um, a solution uh, here in a high infrastructure, high resource setting. So um, this is a fantastic meta study that looked across a wide set of interventions here in particular in sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, the same is true elsewhere where you know, some of the first solutions I might try would be decreasing class size, uh, making sure kids have all the school supplies they need, uh, taking school fees out of the equation and so on. Turns out actually in this meta-analysis that uh, when you have adaptive technology-assisted learning, you can have greater impact than programs that do a number of those other things. So that gives me some hope that learning technologies can actually be useful in supporting equity in education uh, if we design them to, and that means meeting every context where it's at. So in my own work, I uh, look at educational technologies, uh, their design, development, and deployment in a wide range of places around the world. So here you see um, uh, all my sites that, where I've done work in the US, um, Central and South America, in Africa, in Europe, and in East Asia as well. And so, you know, one of the most exciting things for me in my day-to-day -day work is the ability to go into classrooms and see what they look like. So, you know, they may have uh, old school technology with CRT monitors. Uh, they may only have phones or other types of support. Uh, they may be, you know, classrooms that have all kinds of technology-enabled features, and still students uh, are learning in each of these cases, and they also have challenges and opportunities in each of these cases. So what I'm going to do is talk about two illustrative projects um, that think about equity in education at a lower infrastructure and a higher infrastructure setting. And um, here I have a quote of what, uh, you know, something that I believe in from Iris Marion Young, who says, we need the full participation and inclusion of everyone in a society's major institutions and the socially substantive opportunity for all to develop and exercise their capacities and realize their choices. So first I'll tell you guys a little bit about a project that I have in a lower infrastructure setting. Uh, it's called Allo Alpha Bay, and it's a phone-based literacy intervention that we've um, deployed in the Côte d'Ivoire. And in particular, literacy is one of those big challenges in the Côte d'Ivoire. It's a critical precursor for future educational attainment, employment in particular, so leading to the ability to earn an income uh, in the future, and also the capacity for individual development, thinking about civic participation and so on. Literacy is critical. Um, and in fact, there's a huge cost for emerging economies when people are not literate. Uh, and this is one of the challenges that's present in the Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, and so we did a lot of work uh, in some of the early years of this project, just looking at what were the very specific challenges that learners had in their literacy um, um, lessons. In particular, this is a major challenge in a place like the Côte d'Ivoire because most students at home speak a different language than they speak in the classroom. So that makes literacy learning a really big barrier for many students at school, but it also enables them access to all the rest of the schooling, and so it's a critical feature. Um, 
as we were thinking about an educational technology solution, we first thought about going into schools. So can we actually support schools? Um, how do we impact literacy education when kids get there? Uh, but it turns out that this is a context in which many children may not consistently be attending school, and access to educational technology in schools themselves uh, was not an option. So it was difficult for them to bring from home to school, they may not be in school in the first place, and schools didn't have the capacity to sort of keep and, and save um, technology. Um, so, uh, what we find is that uh, technologies um, who, that have been, sorry, this is not advancing, there, right. Uh, um, so there are technologies that uh, are supportive of learning in home environments for education. Um, but what we did not find in the prior work was an approach to using existing mobile educational technology that involves parents, families, or um, learners who are in context outside of um, these weird areas, which I'm not sure if everyone's heard that term before, uh, Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic nations. So outside of those contexts, we just don't know that much about the use of educational technology. Um, however, what we do know is that phones themselves exist and are a major part of what's happening uh, in terms of communication in users' home environments. Um, so, along with a very large set of partners, many from the context uh, of uh, exploration, but also some from around the world, we set out to explore what we might do with educational technology in such a setting. And so in particular, we were working with an ed tech company from Africa called Inesa Education, who was building the technology. Um, the Ivorian Ministry of Education, who's in charge of the curriculum and all of the aspects of learning in the country. And then, um, in particular, a fantastic sociologist from the Cote d'Ivoire who studies rural cocoa communities in order to understand uh, how technology fits into their life and settings. Uh, other participants were Kaya Yuzinska, who um, is a real expert in language uh, and literacy development, uh, and my own student. Uh, Michael Medeo. Um, and so, in order to address the gaps that we were finding here, we designed a phone based literacy intervention. Uh, it in particular focused on phonological awareness and letter sound mapping, which are these core components. If you don't have them, you're not gaining literacy. Uh, and we developed it for children to use at home. And along the way, what we found was that what was very critical for adoption and successful use of this technology was a parent support system at the same time, which was not in our initial plans for development, but over the course of um, two years of contextual inquiry and piloting of systems uh, in, involving about eight months of actually being there in the context, uh, this was one of our discoveries. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we got there. So what we found as we were engaged in this context was that parents provided a variety of literacy support in the home. Um, we found that uh, they were very supportive of using mobile phones in particular for literacy education, but even before we got to that point, they were doing many things to help their kids uh, learn to read and write. Um, some of these involved, um, you know, having their children repeat what they learned at school when they got home if they had uh, the ability to send their kids to, home, uh, to um, school. Um, and in addition, they also would sometimes pay the, you know, small amount of money that they had available to um, acquire home tutors 
uh, you know, adults, sometimes even the teachers uh, in the community to come and give their children extra lessons, sometimes, you know, neighborhood level lessons where a group of children would come by. And so what you can see here is the, um, a picture of one of our uh, learners' homes where he's showing off his uh, blackboard where he's been practicing literacy skills at home. Um, in addition, um, what we found was that many of the parents themselves were not literate. Uh, and so they had to find workarounds for being able to provide uh, literacy support to their children. Um, as I noted, we saw that parents did in fact find mobile devices to be excellent opportunities for children to learn at home. But we found that they had concerns about children's mobile usage, so they wanted them to stay at home uh, while they did uh, with the phones, while they did actually want them to use them for uh, learning uh, whatever lessons they could from school. And one of the things that we found here was that the caregivers really controlled children's access to mobile phones. Uh, a mobile phone was a really important commodity for the family to have, and so. Kids weren't just given free access to it. They had to uh, actually ask for it whenever they wanted it, and their, the usage was controlled. And so this actually worked quite well uh, with the development of a parent-focused system that would also tell the parents around about um, sort of what the child was currently doing, where they were in their lessons, and how they might um, you know, engage them in uh, calling or, or engaging with the, the system. Um, and so what we did as we engaged in this um, uh, community exploration was to start building out our literacy curriculum. So we developed an age-appropriate early literacy curriculum that in particular started with the phonemes, the, the sounds that were um, in common between kids' home languages and French, which is what they were learning in schools. And so we um, built a... Um, AI-based system that could adapt to learners' uh, current skill level in French with the aspects of the French language that were in common with their home language, having the lowest level of difficulty, switching uh, to harder and harder aspects of the literacy curriculum that focused on French-only sounds and, um, uh, and words. And so you just see here a little bit of our uh, architecture diagram, uh, where what we did was had a database um, and the uh, AI focused on the server side of this application. And then, um, so every, all the processing was happening in a central system uh, in the capital city, uh, which was um, supported by our company, our industry partner, Aneza. And then um, when the children would call, what happened was they got a call back from the system. They would call in, hang up, they get a call back from the system, which is able to deliver the lessons through interactive voice response. So they didn't actually need to be literate in order to use the system. It started out purely with a voice-based interface and moved up to uh, SMS and other features of texting that would help them to actually start working on um, letters mapping to sounds, onto words, and then ideally onto sentences, although at that point, that might be where you transition to uh, engaging um, you know, purely in a, a school-based setting or with the, the home tutors. So uh, it meant that the phones themselves didn't have to do any sophisticated processing. We could leave this with basic uh, phones. Um, and also that the families themselves did not get charged for the calls. So uh, the company, in fact, has a system where they work out with the government and also with donors to provide access to funding for enabling these calls to happen for kids. Um, okay, so in our deployment, 
we actually ended up distributing a basic phone to every child. So while we found that 99% uh, of our families had access to a phone, we wanted to keep some things consistent, including the user interface. Um, and so uh, we were able to sort of train everybody on using the same phone, and we knew it would be um, you know, how to debug and how to support on this particular phone model. But it was the most common phone that they had in the, the villages that we were working in. Uh, we engaged in community support sessions that included teachers, parents, guardians, and siblings to explain what the program was about, how it connected to their learning at school, um, to explain how to use the phones, and how to actually call in, and so on. And we engaged with about a thousand families in eight villages, about four schools per village. We also worked with the teachers, as I noted. Uh, we worked with 871 kids, and we distributed 737 phones, you know, multiple kids sometimes per family. And uh, we also stayed connected with these families over the course of the study to make sure that they had technical support and that we could get any questions answered. So here's our awesome team answering questions from the community. Uh, the parents were really engaged and really interested, and so they often had um, you know, questions or wanted support working through some challenges. So our high-level findings here uh, what we found was that there was, in fact, improvement in phonological awareness at the end line of our study. So um, this is uh, a year into the study. We actually have a second year of data now that we're currently analyzing. Uh, but we found a, a, about 11% improvement of phonemic awareness, this core component of literacy and a 48% improvement in letter reading. So you can see the letter reading itself was, um, was an easier task to deliver um, through phone than the phoneme awareness. I think because some of these phonemes were just very challenging to switch between your home language and French. Um, what we found, uh, so, that, so those are the, the um, uh, educational results. So we great, got great results in terms of actually delivering this educational content. Uh, but we were also really interested in what happened in this learning ecosystem. So how did this change the way families interacted? What did they do with these systems? And what we found was that over the course of the study, without us asking, parents recruited many of their family members to help with uh, both the literacy content as well as the IVR system usage. Um, this quote says, we go to the bush for field work, so the children are here with their big brother who's here to help. He helps them study before giving the exercises. We too, when we are there, we call the child and he reads a little with us. So um, these were some of the ways that the parents uh, expanded their educational support for their children's literacy development with the introduction of the phone. So it now gave a tool that siblings could use to engage in this process of instruction. Um, I gave the phone to my child and then I sat and watched him use it. At first, my son did not know how to use it. He did not understand what was being said. I did not know how to manipulate it, so I called my daughter who showed my son, here's what you have to do. So again, you've got distributed knowledge of technological systems as well in the community. And so you see parents pulling in additional community members to help out. Um, here is an aunt that came by, so a, a sibling of one of the parents. And what we found was that these family members helped with motivation, so getting them to call, uh, with structuring. So you can see she's actually asking them to, they're on the phone. <laughs> she's like, what are you hearing on the phone? And she's writing it down. And so she's structuring them, walking through these exercises, and then actually explicitly instructing them on how to use the IVR um, and these French literacy skills often during the calls. So she says, you have to listen carefully. Which one is the right answer among these three words? So she's prompting them to do that. Um, uh, so what we had was a sort of collective intermediation here where they had mutual support and they were bootstrapping this knowledge sharing amongst the community. And this tool was something that enabled them to do this uh, rather than expecting the tool to purely teach literacy all by itself. One of the interesting things that we saw here was around uh, we had 
a number of events that happened over the course of this study. Uh, our first year of data ended sort of like a, a little bit right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but in addition to that, we also had a two month uh, teacher strike in the middle of our study. And so we wondered what might happen when teachers are not available uh, at all and children are not going to school. And what we found that I thought was interesting here uh, was that um, when children went on holiday on the red, you can see their usage really dropped off. And we asked parents about this and they said, yeah, I don't want my kid learning while we're on break. They should you know, enjoy themselves or take a break and, and a mental break and relax from schooling. But what we found when the strike was on in blue was that the phone usage looked pretty much consistent to what they were doing when they were actually in school. And so what we're seeing is that the phone can actually take on some of that uh, support work that is happening when students are going to school. And oftentimes, as I noted, an individual student is going to school intermittently. Of course, there's additional challenge that that brings and lots of interesting ethical questions about uh, you know, whether we want to support teacher strikes or, uh, or introduce educational technology. Happy to talk about that later. Um, but one of the things that we found uh, that uh, was really important for us to tackle next relates to my, my next project that we're doing in the Côte d'Ivoire that's happening right now. It's called the SEME project. And so we were really excited about supporting kids at home, supporting parents and helping them. But we also found that uh, the teachers wanted additional support. Uh, and so our current project is working on teacher professional development in collaboration with the Ministry of Education and a new program they're rolling out, a non-tech based program to help teachers change what they're doing in the classroom and we're building the technology component. But also um, this issue of access to school and who's able to actually attend. And so the second component of that project is one that involves a universal basic income or a cash transfer where we're giving families money over the course of two years uh, in order to support them in making choices about their children's education. So they can do whatever they want with that money. And so we're looking to see, for instance, do they choose to send their kids to school? Uh, and if so, does this teacher professional development actually improve what's happening when they get there? Okay. so. That was my lower infrastructure project where we're looking at you know, how to deliver uh, services uh, in a way that's already consistent in with what's happening in the community and in a place where we may, may not be able to introduce. So all of our tech was really on the server side there. Um, now we're thinking about higher infrastructure settings uh, with a project called EduSense and a, a corollary class insight. And uh, actually that's why I'm here in Iowa because some of you are working with this system here too, and I'm very excited to hear your uh, outcomes with it. Uh, but again, a whole bunch of people really working on this system. Uh, and this also relates to um, professional development for teachers, but now in a high infrastructure setting, so a room that looks more like this. And while our goal in the Côte d'Ivoire was to create equitable opportunities for education, it's also the case that even in a room like this, uh, educational opportunities are not entirely equal or equitable. And so that's, you know, we're thinking about equity across contexts and how to support it uh, when you're within a context and you want to make sure that all the learners there in that particular environment have uh, access that they need to, edu to quality education. So in this case, of course, we're thinking about, you know, the greatest impact on what students think and do, and, and teachers have an enormous impact on that. And so uh, we're helping to magnify the impact that teachers have, hopefully, on equitable outcomes. And so um, we start with this model uh, called Plan, Act, Reflect as the basis for what teachers do in order to improve their classroom on a regular cycle. So. Uh, Acting would be actually the act of teaching. 
Once you're done teaching, you're acting, you're gonna go out and think about it. <laughs> what did I do? How did I, did that go well? What could I change? Uh, and then planning, this is what I am going to change. Here's what I need to do next in my classroom to improve it. And now I go back and act again. Uh, and so that's our general cycle for thinking about uh, teacher professional learning. And one of the things that we did early on in this uh, project hopefully you can see some of that, is actually um, take this model and look at not just teachers, but at other professionals that are engaged in professional learning on a regular basis in a place where kind of what they're doing is a, is a performance. It's, you cannot uh, reflect very well when you're in the middle of doing it. And this is also the case for therapists and for nurses. Uh, and so they're you know, engaged with a patient uh, or with a client and they have to do that job and then they might think about it and plan for the next session afterwards. And so we ran the study to uh, survey across a wide set of these groups to take a look at what's actually happening and what are their challenges with professional learning. And what the uh, fundamental feature of all of these professions that, uh, told us was that professional development did not grow with their level of experience. So when they started out in their job, they got some sort of training, and that training never changed or improved the longer they went on. So I have no you know, support in really growing in my practice because I don't have anybody that's personalizing what I'm doing and telling me something about the problems that I'm really having right now. And so this is where our idea of professional informatics came along. So maybe you've heard of personal informatics. You're collecting data on you know, what you eat or how many steps you take or all of those things you might want to know uh, about yourself and about your life. It takes on a new meaning when we're talking about professionals who are trying to do some sort of learning in their job. And in fact, uh, those sorts of uh, informatics, of information about your daily life, might be incredibly important when it's part of your job. You might think about um, professional athletes, for instance. Think about their data all the time. So we've got this new idea of professional informatics. And some interesting other findings here where uh, all, across all of our participants, they had concerns about whether you could actually measure the things that you were thinking you were measuring uh, and what inferences are you drawing. Um, but they also had uh, different and strong opinions about, for instance, who should have access to their professional informatics data. So some of our participants in some professions um, thought, I don't want anyone to see this data except for me, and that included teachers. So they were very concerned about anyone from their administration, uh, anyone else of maybe even their peers seeing their data, whereas, for instance, um, therapists and nurses were really excited to share their data and thought, you know, if I do this thing really well, I'd like to show my supervisor that I'm engaged in these really great practices or work on those practices with other people. So teachers were in this interesting place where they had more, um, you know, uh, issues with the hierarchy and structure of how their work environment existed. And so, what we did in order to um, move forward with this information, while they found it incredibly valuable to think about, okay, now I actually could have the, the ability to get a personalized approach to my own professional development, it's got to be just for me. So we made deals with districts and at, you know, we're deploying the system also at Carnegie Mellon University that only the teachers would ever have access to this data. And so what we're doing there is using this system that we've built called EduSense for classroom data collection and extracting meaningful features from it. Um, and in particular, what I want to extract are features that focus on equity. So who in the classroom has a voice in this conversation? Uh, who is being heard? Who's being paid attention to? And how are they engaging? And so what we do is we have this classroom set up. You can see a blow up of the uh, camera here, um, which is back near the door. Um, 
and in particular, the important thing for me here was to project this camera towards what the teachers themselves were doing. So there's a lot of systems that look at student analytics. So what are the students doing? But our concern was, what is the teacher doing that can impact what the students are doing? And so we've got a 3D face and body pipeline, um, and all uh, where we use um, uh, a variety of systems, including open pose, open face, retina face, and so on, uh, to do um, a variety of extraction of features. Um, but you can see here our video. So it's a quick setup for these cameras, but we have them permanently installed, so they're part of the infrastructure. And then um, one of our students sets up a set of Aruco markers. This has to happen one time per classroom so that you get the layout, like where all the important features of the classroom are and so on. And then uh, it just does a really quick uh, capture of the classroom. It calibrates and you label them as, you know, these are the particular features that you're gonna see. Um, and then, oh. Ah, next slide, all right. So then we digitize the classroom. And so you can see the digital version of all the features that you saw just there, I hope. Uh, yeah, so you've got a podium, you've got whiteboards, you've got uh, you know, the layout, and then uh, what you can see now are all the students who have come into class. So we can detect all these bodies that are moving around as they are coming into the class. You can see the instructor and their gaze. Um, and so this is just like a digital mock-up sort of, of of what we're doing. But we find all the bodies in the room and start extracting these meaningful features. Um, OK. Right, so those are things like um, movement and location. So uh, you might look at an example here where you see a classroom with a very low level of movement. So that might be somebody uh, I haven't been doing so well on this metric probably over <laughs> the course of half an hour, but someone who's standing right here behind the podium the entire time versus someone you might have seen I'm trying to uh, you know, travel over here so that I you know, include you guys in the conversation as well, as well as uh, making sure that I stay on the camera. Um, so uh, you can see a distinct difference in the heat map of you know, a professor who's staying there versus one who's sort of engaging and even coming down into the middle of class to engage with uh, participants uh, in the class in, in sort of a, a more personal way. Over here, uh, we've got arm poses, uh, open or closed posture, things like hand raises, which can help us find who's talking in the class. So um, that, along with audio features, can help us identify, you know, uh, maybe it's only the front row of the class that's ever speaking. <laughs> and how do we think about uh, showing that to the instructor in order to help them, you know, um, change their patterns and practices to move towards, you know, the other students in the class who are not having access. Uh, that's assisted by knowing the location of all the students in the classroom, for instance. Uh, student and teacher gaze is another thing that turns out to be really important in the learning sciences literature in terms of actually having an impact on both uh, enjoyment and engagement in the class, but also learning outcomes as well. Uh, we all know that attention is a critical feature of learning, and the way that you get attention is by doing these sorts of things, uh, by engaging with each person individually and making sure that you're actually including them in that classroom environment. So here you can see the instructor gaze, where they're paying attention pretty much to this side of the class, and that front half of the class never really getting any attention. Um, we can also look at where the students are looking, but we yeah. don't actually ever track individual students. So I have no idea who any of these students are. Uh, we just pretty much aggregate across them to see, like, you know, for the most part, we can also look at, uh, at um, interactions between the two. So is what the teacher doing impacting what the students do? Uh, and then a gaze of a heat map and dwell time of the gaze. So are they looking at the blackboard, watching you write? Are they looking at you know, slides? Are they looking down at their desk? Those sorts of features. 
<clears throat> we also have um, uh, a project called Class Insight, which I noted, which looks at the dialogic features of the class. We're also really interested in the audio and what's happening when students are talking. And so we've got a process of actually annotating classroom discussion, uh, and we're automating that as well to look at, you know, um, one of the questions that my collaborators are interested in are, um, you know, if we, uh, look at whose comments are getting uptake and who's able to actually have an impact on the course of a class conversation. And that might, that in and of itself might not be something you could automatically detect, but when you show teachers some of this data, they start drawing inferences about those sorts of things themselves. And so here we have a model of teacher professional development from Clark and Hollingsworth that includes um, pedagogical actions that the uh, teachers are taking, um, the knowledge and beliefs that the teachers have when they come into the experience, uh, and then we have Class Insight, uh, which is collecting data to help support the other features of this model, uh, sort of what's happening in the classroom. And so here's just an example of uh, the um, uh, dashboard that we use to engage with teachers. And so you can see down here a high-level view of their last class. So teachers talked 94% of the time and students 6% of the time. You know, is that what you'd like to see in a discussion-based classroom? Um, we can dive down into a more medium-grained view of what's happening in class. So this is uh, the start of class down to the bottom of class and who's talking at any one time. As you can see, that's an entirely teacher talk until you get down to here, um, and it shows the classification of the utterances into different types of talk. And then the teachers can dive down into the actual transcript and see what students were actually saying or what they were saying that may have led to changes in the conversation. But actually, it turns out that that very high level is really important for the teachers to even get a sense that there's something that they might want to change. So that reflection process I showed you in the beginning uh, before they go on to planning their next step. So you know, some of the things that we see in our, um, in our uh, teacher reflection sessions when we look at, show them just that high level view of what's happening in their class. And they're the sorts of reactions you might think, gray is me talking, which seems like a really high amount, uh, too high. <laughs> so that's immediately a signal of something they may not have been able to observe. So we're making what's invisible in their classroom really visible here for them to see. Uh, and then they start thinking about, well, where do I go in my reflection from there? I'd like to know a little bit more about what's in the assorted teacher talk, like what was going on there and what was I doing? And then they set goals from that. I'd like to see my students talking more. That's a, that's a high level goal, but it's a really important one. Um, when they dive down into that medium grain, what you see are things like, uh, it would be nice to see some students answering. So now they're getting into what's happening in that uh, transactive part of the class. Like when I'm asking a question, I don't see the students themselves answering. Are they giving me open-ended statements, closed-ended, what's happening? Um, or they can look, and this one is interesting to me, um, I can look at this and be like, oh yeah, it worked. So they're thinking about their own action research. Can I try something out in my classroom and then use this data to see if I actually changed the way I was doing things? Um, and if I'm trying to adjust it, I'd like to see my next visualization flipped to the other side. I want to see it. This is what I want to see in my next class. Um, and so uh, we also have some support for goal setting because that's a really important component of this process as well. So they can set overarching goals uh, by looking at, you know, actually um, uh, setting goals for themselves in numerical goals within their data, or they might just want to say things like, I want to increase how often my students engage in, uh, you know, revoicing. Um, so if they don't have a numerical goal, no problem. This is something, you know, the direction that I'd like to see my class moving in. 
All right, so what we've seen is that overall, teachers get an enormous amount out of reflecting with this tool, and we can actually see over time the conceptual change that they're making in how they think about their classroom, and in particular, what I, I didn't show you an example of this, but we also have them set uh, focus on equity-focused goals, and so we can have them connect all of these reflections back to their focus on equity. So what we don't know yet in this project is, does it have an impact on student outcomes? We'd like to see that too, but right now we're focused on, can we actually get teacher change in a way that we think will have an impact on student outcomes? And so there are new challenges here. We're now working on taking that um, uh, sort of visualization that you saw of where students are in the classroom and so on, and uh, zooming into VR, because VR is a place where you can do perspective taking. So you might imagine that there's a particularly important moment in my teaching, and uh, maybe the system is identifying this as important, but I don't know why as a teacher it's important. What if I take you into VR, show you just that moment, and show you it from the perspective of a student sitting in the back of the classroom who's not getting any attention? So we think this is a way that VR might be used to actually increase the impact of some of these reflections or maybe where teachers uh, you know, have some struggles thinking through what, why something is important or, or what their classroom might look like if it were different. The other thing, of course, is hybrid teaching. So now we're in this case where you've got uh, people online, people in the classroom, you're trying to deal with all of this at the same time, and you've got a number of other challenges. And so uh, we're about ready to pick up something that we left off pre-pandemic, which was real-time uh, support in the classroom. So really simple things like um, uh, a swipe bar that shows like a uh, countdown to when you should stop talking <laughs> um, or uh, how long you've waited after asking questions or maybe being able to uh, show a heat map of the class and show you know where students uh, where you haven't engaged with students in a long time uh, you could imagine that there's a, a whole extra cognitive load of dealing with hybrid teaching but maybe there are ways we can investigate reducing that cognitive load for teachers so that they don't have to constantly be paying attention. The system could maybe alert them to where there's a particular need. Okay, so those are my two projects. Uh, we've done a lot of engagement with the learning ecosystem in each one of them, uh, learning some really important things along the way. First of all, of course, is context-sensitive design is critical. We also, number two, think a lot about physical infrastructure, what's available where and, and when and how, uh, and what is actually comfortable and, and able to be used by our participants. We think about the human infrastructure, so adding that um, parent and family component onto our first project wasn't something we had initially considered, but the humans in the environment are such a critical part and we want to make sure they're included too. And then finally, some thoughts on need for policy and regulation. So I think we're really excited about the work we're doing with these classroom sensors. Uh, we think it's really of high value to instructors. But what happens with that data? And what happens if you were to try to commercialize this, to, to sell it to schools? How does it get used in the future? Um, what impact does that have on students and teachers? And so these are things that we're thinking about as well, but with a clear need that this should not be distributed without having those things in place. All right. I am done talking. There's so many people involved in all of this research, and you could never make any of this happen without all the people involved in the context being active participants. And so uh, thank you. I'd be really excited to, to talk with all of you about any of the, the work you saw here today, and particularly those of you who are engaged with the EduSense system here. Love to hear about that too. And thanks for uh, you know, going on this journey with me today. I think we have time for questions. Great. Can I make a comment? Yes. Um, I'm grateful to APM for the work. Can you? <laughs> the reason is uh, we have an active EduSense project. They are using EduSense and installing EduSense in our state of classrooms and using the system with engineering faculty here to promote active learning in classrooms. We've had the team faculty, because I have to stay, never actually shut down. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we could collect data. <laughs> well, we couldn't. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's, it's very complex. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like oh, yeah. Challenging and how to resolve Yeah, great. I'm constantly doing things in this work that I never expected to be doing. And so, yeah, we work with the registrar. We work with the media tech folks. Um, I've uh, given presentations to the campus redesign uh, committee that's thinking about, oh, maybe we should put more active learning spaces or make it easier. So one of the things that we can do is talk about um, all the engagement that we've had with professors uh, through this project saying, well, how can I change anything here? The podium is here. I, I can't move away. There's nothing I can do to change. And so talking with the campus uh, redesign design committee has actually helped us think through, well, you know, if there are ways to make the classroom more flexible such that uh, instructors feel empowered to actually change some of these things. And when we get talking to instructors about strategies they can use to, to move away from their laptop or to, to talk to different people in the class, they're really receptive to it. But when, when the classroom infrastructure doesn't they don't feel like it permits it, then it shuts that, that uh, change down in the very first place. So yeah, we've had a lot of engagement with folks all across campus in doing this. And um, also a lot of word of mouth from one instructor to another talking to each other about, oh, if you want to improve your teaching, you know, this group could help you think about like these are the things you're doing and so on. So working within that ecosystem also of, of uh, professors talking to each other has been really important, too. I got, I got a question for yes. You. Yeah, so this was something that parents there were really concerned about, and one of the reasons why they didn't want to just hand their phones over all day. And uh, in addition to a, you know, a phone being a valuable resource, also spending any money on the phone, you know, making calls, sending texts, and so on, is expensive for the parents. So that's exactly why they didn't want their kids to have the phone unless they were engaged in a learning activity. And so um, we did not see much of that because there was always someone around supervising. So whether it was a sibling, uh, you know, um, a neighbor, a parent, uh, you know, any of these members of the community, um, there was really a support structure in, in, in engaging with the phones. And I don't know why I don't have this result in here, but what we found was that students, the learners who reported uh, family support, uh, engaged in significantly more calls to the IVR, and also the number of calls you had predicted your gains. So even just doing that, having that family support around, led to more engagement with the system and uh, more impact on their learning outcomes. And so, uh, you know, maybe in this case, the parents were right, <laughs> trying to keep their kids away from that uh, sort of uh, disruptive influence of other opportunities. Of course, a little bit less you can do on a basic phone than you know on a smartphone, but even so, there's ways to spend money. <laughs> yes, hi. I got a... Oh yeah. Back on 
Yeah. That is a great set of questions. <laughs> um, so we, of course, have to, um, actually, the interesting thing about some of this research is that uh, the way the IRB construes it, we are only collecting uh, data from the instructors. They are actually not viewing this as collection of student data. And so what that allows us to do is purely assent the students rather than a written consent. So what we do is we go in the class, you know, usually we've, we've already discussed for quite a while with the professor, um, and then the professor introduces the study to the class, but we come in and we also talk about like, well, this is the data, uh, here's what it will look like, and so on, and then we assent the students. If there's any, you know, everybody, is everybody okay with this? And we have had classes, a few, where students are like, no, Nope, not for me, and then we just don't engage with that class at all. Um, but I would say 97%, I think, is the figure of classes that actually um, were okay with us being in there. And I think the val they see the value in it being um, a system that might help improve their own experience in the class. And so we are exactly doing this research right now. We have not focused as much as I'd like on the student populations, but we have an interview and survey protocol that we're running, uh, you know, we're piloting right now to actually engage with students in co-design around what would you like to see if your teacher could improve based on, you know, the, the types of data we're collecting and what are the outcomes you would like to see from this data? Would it help you? choose classes next semester if you could see this data. Would you like it to just um, you know, improve your current class and the you know, engagement you get in this class? Do you think it should actually be used for faculty evaluations? So we're, we're currently about to, start to talk to students in more depth about that and also get more depth from um, administrators as well. So starting looking more across the, the ecosystem. Uh, so I can guess that administrators would say, I'd like this data and I want to use it to evaluate my faculty. And that's, I think that's what we want to avoid. We know for sure that's what the faculty do not want. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that is a great question. Is there actually change? Um, yeah, so you might hope for that. <laughs> There's technology in my class, so I'm going to do things better. Um, it's hard to tell because you have to observe in order to quantify, and so if you're you get the um, Hawthorne effect. You're, uh, you're observing, and so by uh, definition, you're, you're maybe changing their behavior. But I guess what I say is, and Avrim, mean, I think you're doing this too, we're in there all semester long. It's really hard to um, you know, permanently change your behavior because there's a technology you know, in there every day. Uh, and if they do change be just because the technology is there, that's great. But what I will say is from the numbers that we're seeing, like the percentage of teacher talk time and the percentage behind a podium time, they're not changing <laughs> anything. And there's a long way to go towards improvement. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, my question has to do with uh, uh, the group party with the 
reaction and inflection mm -hmm. and the pictures when they were looking at the Union Grave Science uh, actual coats was done on here at the very end of doing an action research. Uh, there are some preliminary uh, results done in terms of what was that nature of action research. Do they talk about um, uh, them being lagging in uh, being an instructor teacher or are they talking Yeah. Um, great question. And so we have the system that we're using with college instructors, and we have the system that we're using with K-12 instructors, really high school science teachers. Um, and uh, we see very different results with the two. So uh, college instructors tend not to have a framework for talking about these things. So many of them have never been taught how to teach. Uh, they're you know, um, reiterating strategies that they saw when they were in the classroom. And so what we see are much more um, uh, low level strategies that they're using in their planning. So oh, well, what if I got a, uh, a pointer and then I could, you know, step away and move over here but still have access to the board? So they're talking about, um, you know, tools that they could use to change their teaching but less about particular pedagogical strategies. And so uh, one of the things that we have noticed there is that they really need that strategy support. So um, we work on integrating that into some of the materials that we're providing once they say, oh, this is something I want to change. Uh, then, you know, well, here are resources for, you know, things you might do to actually impact that. Uh, whereas the high school teachers have access to uh, pedagogical strategies in their repertoire, and they may not be activating them in any particular point in time. Even so, they still, when they, uh, they still um, talk about things like, I just need to get my students to talk more. So we still hear that from teachers, and sometimes it's implicit, the things that they might do to do that, but they feel much more confident that that's something they could, in fact, achieve. And so one of the things that we're doing with them right now, so in our with our high school teachers. Uh, we are engaging with them on a, about a monthly basis to go through this data with them, engage in a reflection session together. Um, and uh, so that's where we see them start to explore these um, uh, challenges or puzzles that they see in their data and start to plan what they might do next. But what I'm really interested in is uh, speeding up that cycle. So what we're, uh, the next study we're running with them, uh, we're calling it a tweaking study, where uh, on a more like a bi-weekly basis, they're getting um, a, a, a prompt to go to an app and engage just for 10 minutes on making that planning uh, more reactive. So, you know, during this in-depth reflection session where you, you know, talked with a professional and you looked deeply at your data and reflected on what was happening with it, you came up with these goals and these potential actions to achieve that goal, uh, which, you know, typically were strategies that they already had in their repertoire. Um, okay. Now, today, did you take any of those actions and what was the effect? And then on, you know, Tuesday, all right. Uh, oh, and sorry, and a third one, which is, you know, do you want to change anything about your action? Uh, next Tuesday, okay, did you take any of those actions? Does it change your, you know, did it impact your goal? Do you want to change your action? And so they're not reflecting on their data with the system um, every time, but they're engaged in their own personal reflection based on what they observed in the class. Classroom. So I think that's where we're going to see more of that action research happening, and I'm really excited about collecting that data. But right now, what we have is, um, you know, they're 
conceptual change over the course of the semester or a year happening sort of one, on a monthly basis. And we're still seeing that. So they tend to move from that high level down to the um, more fine-grained level um, over time. And we're seeing this real um, importance of starting with that coarse grain level before you dive in uh, to that fine grain level. It's a lot of talk. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is, is if the project is running, is it still running? Yes. Okay. And can you uh, visualize the project in another uh, context, like other countries with the, another languages? How complex uh, will it be to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. So um, there are multiple components to the project. Um, one is just making sure that the um, physical infrastructure is consistent. So do people actually have phones at home? Is this something they can use? How do they use them? Um, is it something that parents would be willing for their kids to engage with? Uh, then there's the... Um, uh, algorithmic adaptation of the lessons, which I think should be fairly scalable and transferable. But where you would also want to change things would be at that uh, language model level. So what we've done is identify the set of difficulty factors in where the kids are trying to go from their home language to their school language, uh, and then the um, the underlying system is adapting to those difficulty factors. So all you have to do is plug in a different set of difficulty factors, and you'd want to identify those, you know, based on the languages that are being used. So I think I would uh, change the underlying language models, make sure you know sort of what the difficulty um, factors are for kids in that particular context, and then do an investigation to make sure that there aren't major differences in the uh, context in, in how phones are used and engaged. And I think, yeah, so I'd, I think you could definitely do it much easier than, you know, the first time around. Uh, we would be able to find easy ways to adapt this to a new context. Yeah, I would love to do that if anybody has anywhere they're excited about. <laughs> Well, uh, I think that was it. So yeah. thank you, everybody. I hope uh, we'll get a chance to chat and talk in, in the next few minutes for those of you who can stick around. Thank you again. Thank you.